First and foremost, I'd like to thank everybody who's come to my thesis defense. It means a lot to me, and I did invite each and every one of you individually for that purpose. Um, let's get started. This is going to be a chronological investigation on my work, starting from the fall of 2009 up until my thesis project, Things That Fly. Yep. In my initial fall independent studio, I began to play with the idea of perception and belief. Traveling to various locations in upstate New York, I found inspiration in the ideas of the national park system. Parks made to look like the wilds. <clears throat> in my first project, I stole a tree from Catskill State Park in New York and replaced it with a small Douglas fir tree. The idea that was in reality was that in reality, there is no difference to the design except to those who understand. In this image, you can see the area that it existed prior to my intervention. This is the hole where I removed the plant, causing a tear in the other rise serene forest. This is the tree that was replaced. The native species of tree to this area is the white birch. However, unless you are a native to the area or know the area, you might not know this in the larger context of a larger image. It becomes an intervention into the natural landscape of the area. However, over time and growth, the plant will adapt and fit in or it will perish and die. The concept here is that in order to understand the function of something that is site-specific, you need to have a knowledge beforehand. Otherwise, a discourse on the topic is necessary. This is the final installation of the project for Open Studios 2009. The tree in the pot and the white fir is actually, oh, is actually a completely different plant, intending to show the bonding of man and nature. My next project would take me to Arizona, and it was created over the winter break of 2009. I was in Arizona with my family and wanted a little time to myself to blow off some frustrations that I had had. I decided to channel the energy into a project that would be both site-specific and unrepeatable. The idea of watching a bag of ice melt in the desert came to me not only uh, not as a pre-planned notion, but rather because I had a bag of ice in the back of my car and I wondered to myself how long it would take for it to melt in the desert. And what if any reaction the desert would have to my intervention of the natural space? It took about 75 minutes for the bag to melt into the soil I had placed it on. What was interesting in the study was how both how far the water spread through the soil out into the surrounding area, and by changing the angle of the shot, being able to change your perspective on the rock, making it to appear more of an edifice. In the desert, things are very momentary. Immediately after the ice had melted, a small desert plant began to sprout from the newly moistened soil. This initial photography in Arizona provided me with the spark to what would lead to my spring project, natural intervention. I had never been to Arizona in a time of rain, so my experience of the West in general is one of a Chuck Jones cartoon or a 1950s Hollywood Western. In this study, I realized that man had no right to exist in the environment of the desert. Man had built land that was in extremes, and defying nature built roads. Where once was water with no consideration of the fact that perhaps they should acknowledge the fact that once water ran through what was now a dry riverbed. Instead, nature took its course to intervene in the course of development of man, and in this case, caused a natural intervention in the imagery. Where once a highway bypass existed, only mud and water took its place creating defining moments that piqued my interest and caused me to keep going back to take more images. Nature, in its attempt to take back what man had built, still left small marks of humanity. However, those who live in Arizona took this as a headache. But again, as somebody who does not know, I took it for a sign that man needed to reconsider his current methods of working with the natural world. This is the defining image of the series. 
In it, we see the Salt River I-10 bypass. In the background of the image is the Apache Native American Reservation that surrounds the eastern borders of the Phoenix Valley. A trash fire rising and cutting the image from the pristine mountain view can be seen. In the foreground is the meat of the photograph. The road that had once been used as a vital highway bypass had been overcome. The river ceases to, ceases to, the road ceases to exist beyond a solitary speed limit sign. At the same time, I was working on another project called Undeveloped Developments. Arizona throughout its history had been a boom and bust state. The real estate boom of the mid 2000s had coined Phoenix East Los Angeles. Investors went in to build without any buyers. The land had been divided between the desert and man-made bastardizations. Grass grew where it had no right to exist. In various locations, I would climb large hills to get panoramic views of the land. Following in the concept of the new topographers such as Joe Deal, I looked to see the changes the land had undergone with man infracting into the environment. The problem being that man expanded, but then left the areas completely unattended. This is another image. This is my uncle's uh, development that he lives in. In the image on the left, you can see the area which is inhabited. There are houses. And to the right is a shopping center where they blew up half a mountain to put in a shopping center, and it was completely abandoned. So there is no shopping center, just emptiness and half a mountain, which was destroyed in the process. In later images, I went to seek various developments that no longer even had financial backing and who had abandoned their projects but still left indelible marks on the landscape. I found it particularly interesting that even in these locations, the last vestiges of mankind were usually children's playgrounds. In this particular location, the grass was still green because it was being fed by a sewer line that had burst. And uh, because of the financial crisis in Arizona, nobody was fixing it at the time. Following the natural intervention series, I was faced with the summer of 2010, which would prove to be my most challenging summer, as well as the summer that would produce the first glimpses of my thesis project. In the summer of 2010, my family went through an extremely painful and public issue. As part of seeking my understanding of a situation I had no control over, I began my series, American Beauty. As part of this project, I interviewed art critic Jerry Saltz, who called for my father's artwork to be kept from public view for 60 years. My response was to create this image, taking both his image and text from the interview to attempt to understand what had happened. Aside from the public debacle going on during that summer, I was attempting to find meaning in imagery that I couldn't really understand, that of female commercial advertisement, which is generally made by men, eludes me. My idea was to take an image in context, pixelate it, to show my own personal misunderstandings of the image, and then move the female form out from the background to try to sublimate the image down to its base form, still maintaining the pixelization as a basis of my own understanding to hold on to. I believe through doing this I, was brought, this, I brought out a basic understanding of the female form, not determined by the normal features that American culture finds beautiful, but instead relying on the beauty of colors and basic shapes of the female form. In the same project, I combed through Facebook to find girls who I had, for one reason or another, had a crush on. I then took their Facebook profile image and reduced it to pixels. The basic concept being that I didn't understand what had happened in these relationships. This line continued throughout the summer as confusion and basic misunderstandings of the American media system became apparent to me. At the same time, I was building toy airplanes for friends to calm down my own anxieties and worries. And these are the first glimpses of the thesis project. Um, so from a very young age, I've always been a builder. I find it incredibly comforting when I'm anxious to sit down and build something. It was through this process that I found my thesis project, Things That Fly. A video that I took from an airplane while it was landing helped inspire attention 
that I was feeling when I traveled that I wanted to get out in imagery form. So I captured video footage of the inside of a plane landing. This is also to reinforce the cognitive notion of suspension of time and belief. When we travel, we are not in a single location. We are in a suspended state. And the idea here is that in the moments just before landing, there's a specific tension that becomes created because as you travel, you're not in any specific space. You're sort of stuck in a little bit of a time warp almost as you travel through different time zones. But then once you get down to landing and also at takeoff, a tension builds that you're, you're almost there and that you've almost arrived. And so through this video, I hope to bring out some of that intentional tension. Things That Fly is an autobiographical project based on my childhood up until now, on my love and obsession with aircraft. When I was very young, I would spend hours at my grandfather's house in Rosedale, Queens, on my back staring at the airplanes coming into the land. There are locations when you're close to an airport where the airplane begins or ends its ascension into the great oblivion of the sky. In these areas, you can still maintain the size of the giant mechanical beast yet they seem almost toy-like in their appearance. And this is a video. Um, I'm going to pause it in the middle so that you guys can sort of get an idea of what I'm talking about. Oh. Right here. Just as the plane moves overhead, it becomes something different. It goes from being a plane in the distance to a plane landing, but in that middle point, it becomes an edifice. It becomes something completely different than what you would normally associate it with. And of course, after it moves away, because it's so momentary, it then just goes back to being a normal aircraft. In these moments, I find a place that I can only explain as a third reality, a space and time frame that, although incredibly tense, is also trapped in a moment. And in these moments, I seek to capture the image. At time, the imagery can elicit almost romanticized religious imagery, as in the image above. Or at other times, I have turned my aircraft into animals, whales breaching into the sky in moments of pure joy. It's through that imagery that I'm trying to use as a conduit to translate the unspeakable language of my mind and give you an idea of what I am thinking. I'm also attempting to abstract the thought of aircraft. My first experiment with this was the so-called coconut plane. I was bored one day at the beach where I took my previous images and in my boredom, collected things I found on the beach to create an aircraft. This is one of the shots. That's a little bit bigger shot. Um, and of course, there was no glue or anything, so I was using sand to sort of hold everything into place at the time. And as well, I created a short video piece in the surrounding environment, again, working off my instincts to build on what I've observed. Here's the coconut plane out of context of the beach. By itself, it has a sort of primordial idea of what an airplane could be. 
I've likened it to the South Pacific tribes who during World War II would build aircraft thinking they were gods. As I continued to build different things, I found myself taking wing templates and then abstracting them as I built up. So my built wings are what I consider abstract notions of concrete thoughts. The intricate use of smaller pieces of balsa wood to create curves is a new interest that I have. To curve an object without breaking it is very interesting to me, especially with balsa, which is a very soft wood and very easy to break into pieces. With some of the objects I've built, I've attempted to follow nature's path in creating bent wings and using the constant pressure of wood pressing against other pieces of wood to create an almost bug-like aircraft. And uh, if you can see, the wood, every, every piece of wood here is actually a straight piece of wood. And it's only by the pressure of the smaller pieces of wood that it can bend up. And it actually took me a couple drawings, which I almost never do for this type of stuff. It took me a couple drawings to figure out how to get that going. This one I call the ornithopter. The idea came to me as I saw a trapped dragonfly in my studio. It is also a point of discussion to talk about the shadows that these objects cast. And we'll get back to that after the following slide. This image exhibits a closer view of how the objects are built. I employ hot glue in all of my sculptures and find the fact that once it begins to cool, that I can use my fingers to mold it to let me have more intricate control over how it dries in relation to the pressure points I'm creating to let the wings shift. Uh, and the important part is that one little tiny brace there is what is causing the wing to be uh, angled upward. The shadows cast upon the ground show a subconscious interest in structures. It also speaks to an unspeakable interest I have in objects that are built for one reason and come out with a second meaning. This next set of images shows the context of the built objects as a whole in a built environment. And I'll try and explain just a little bit of uh, what I'm doing here. Um, the airplanes that I took in photograph were all ascending. And so what I'm trying to figure out here is how to make them ascend and descend, but create sort of a world in and of itself. So the idea is that you would walk underneath and then put your head up in the middle so that these things are all around you. And here's the objects in their hung state in different forms of turns and ascensions. And as you can see, uh, two of the planes that were in my summer 2010 projects are shown in this project as well. And you can also see the wings as well. 